Welcome everyone to a new Jan session within our Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization online seminar series. We are very pleased to be back and to see many participants today. And as always, we are going to have three speakers and all the questions will be asked at the end. But if you have some urgent matters, you can write it in the chat. Our first speaker is Nathan Justin from University of Southern California. And he is going to talk about learning optimal classification trees with us to distribution shifts. So all yours. Thank you so much. So let me share my screen. Uh, so hi everybody, my name is Nathan Justin, and uh, today I'll be talking about um, learning optimal classification trees, robust to distribution shifts. And so this work is done in collaboration with Sina Agai, Andres Gomez, and Vivi Vianos, and all of us are from the University of Southern California. So to begin, I want to motivate um, our problem with an example from the uh, Los Angeles area, which is where the University of Southern California is. So in Los Angeles, there's a growing homelessness crisis. There are over 75,518 people experiencing homelessness as of June 2023. And um, there are about only 28,600 permanent housing units to allocate to these people. So the Los Angeles Homelessness Services Authority faces the problem of collecting data on unhoused individuals and using that data to assess and improve their current systems and policies around the services that they provide. So there are three key research areas surrounding the collection and usage of such data about unhoused individuals. So the first two are about the questions asked to obtain information, which is the assessment phase, and then the process of collecting data, which is the administration phase. Then downstream, we will use such data to create predictive models and inform policies. So you can imagine that it's the assessment and administration phase are controlled by social scientists, and the application phase um, will um, be controlled by um, data scientists. So the current set of questions used to collect information on housed individuals is the vs bidat And it's used to train a uh, triage, prioritize, or match individuals' resources. And so in this iteration of the survey, there are um, questions such as, do you do things that may be considered risky, like exchange sex for money, run drugs for someone, um, have unprotected sex with someone you don't know, share a needle, or anything like that? So you can imagine several issues with this question. Uh, one asks very sensitive info, and two, it's very wordy and perhaps confusing. And so this may make people feel uncomfortable to answer to the best of their ability. So you can't get a proper assessment of a person's true vulnerability. So the qualitative part of the re team will rephrase the questions to make them more sensitive and recommendations about when, how, and who should give the survey um, will also be implemented. However, on the data side, you can imagine that there will be distribution shifts between the training and the deployment data. So a distribution shift occurs when, for, when your training data um, looks different from what you would see in their actual application. And this can kind of cause poor performance in any trained model. So um, this gives us a few pillars of motivation. So one, because we are um, interested in high stakes settings where distribution shifts may occur, we need interpretability to establish trust in a learned model. We also would like to have optimality for prediction accuracy and ensure decision quality. And we would also like guaranteed performance even under distribution shifts. And I will put another wrench in there in that since we are operating with survey data in such an application, we also want our model to work with integer or categorical features. So with all this motivation in mind, we developed an MIP formulation for optimal robust classification trees. So in case you don't know what a classification tree is, a classification tree is a model which takes the form of a binary tree. Then at each branching node, a test is performed, which asks if a feature exceeds a specific threshold value. Then a data sample based on its features follows a path from the root of the tree to the leaf node based on these tests. Then at each leaf, we, label, we predict a label. So now that we um, motivated our problem, let's talk about our problem formulation mathematically. So we wanna solve the following problem. So first we wanna choose some classification tree pi with maximum depth D. 
that maximizes the training accuracy, which is the same thing as maximizing the number of correctly classified training samples in the worst case distribution shift, which we model as a perturbation of our data. So more specifically, the objective will sum over all samples I, where co for covariate XI, um, we perturb our sample by um, C, then put it to our tree pi, then see if um, it's correctly classified or not. And we do this for every sample, then summing over all of them, then we get the count of correctly classified samples. So um, now I'll walk through each segment of this formulation. So to characterize the tree pi, we define the set of um, branching tests and labels assigned. And we can do so by encoding the, um, this information into binary distance variables b, v, and w. So the details here are not important, but just know that there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the elements of um, how we encode our tree pi, um, the elements of s into our trees pi. So there's, one -to -one, uh, there's a one-to-one -one, um, correspondence between this set and our set of trees. So we can define any decision tree pi with b, v, and w. So next, we want to get a worst case distribution shift of our data. And so we need to define a set of possible shifts of the covariance of our data. And this is through our perturbation set, capital C. So we define a perturbation to be lowercase c, which is a matrix of integers such as for capital X, our training data set, the set of all x plus c defines our uncertainty set. So one important note here is that C must be integral since, uh, again, we are interested in um, settings where we have integer covariance. And so this departs from most uncertainty sets um, that are considered in rob robust optimization literature. And so standard approaches in robust optimization may not necessarily apply to our problem. So now that we define what our perturbation is, we want to restrict this set of possible perturbations and data through a simple cost of budget framework. And what this looks like is that we'll let gamma IF be some non-negative real value indicating the cost of perturbing some training sample I at feature F. So this left-hand side of the inequality in this definition of capital C is the total cost of perturbing the data, where the total cost will be related to the magnitude of perturbation in each dimension and the cost of a unit shift in that particular dimension. And then we restrict this total cost by some budget epsilon, giving us a set of possible perturbations. So an advantage of this definition is that it provides a simple interpretation of our uncertainty set, and each feature can be independently defined with any costs. And so thus, this definition adapts to different distribution shifts in each feature and even data sample. So we can extend this definition to also include one-sided uncertainty, where our perturbations may, uh, for example, shift uh, in completely one direction, and it can also support categorical features um, with some tweaking. And lastly, this uncertainty that um, we can connect it to hypothesis testing in order to calibrate the parameters gamma and epsilon, although I will not be covering that in this talk. So now that we defined our um, set of possible um, perturbations, now we wanna define our objective function. And so um, by just that first glance, you can see that our objective function of counting the number of correctly classified samples is highly nonlinear and discontinuous. So in order to get around this, we will use uh, a method that transforms the problem of counting the number of correctly classified points as a maximum flow problem. So um, we'll start with a graph that resembles our classification tree structure. And for a single sample, we classify by starting at root node one, then working our way down to the tree and eventually classifying the samples at the leaves. So let's add a source node to the root as an entry point for some sample, then connect all of our leaf nodes where we classify a sample into a sync node, where we say that a training sample that is correctly classified will end up at the sync T. So making this a directed graph, we can see that for a single sample, a path from S to T would indicate a correct classification. Then we'll say that each training data sample induces a graph. So for some given sample xj, see that its value would make it branch left at node one, then branch right at node two, and then also at node three would branch left. And then we would then add the arcs um, that go left from node one, right at node two, and then left at node three in our induced graph, which is shown by these bold green arcs. And say that our tree assigns a correct label for xj only at leaf seven. So let's add uh, the arc from, um, node seven to sync node T as again shown in bold. So um, the nodes plus the bolded green arcs here would be the induced graph for XJ. 
And we can see that for xj, we would misclassify here because we would go from one to two to five, then at five, we would um, incorrectly classify. And so if we, induce a, if we introduce a capacity of one for each of these bolded arcs, and then for the unbolded ones, we have a capacity of zero, we can see that a maximum flow of zero, um, we'll have a maximum flow of zero in this graph, which indicates an incorrect classification. Uh, and say for another sample, um, we would um, instead go from one to two to four and actually correctly classify. And so then we would have a maximum flow of one indicating a correct classification. And so therefore we have shown a correspondence between a maximum flow problem and a correct classification. So it's worth noting here that integer program formulation for this kind of flow-based classification tree already exists for a non-robust case. But of course, in our case, we can have perturbations of our data, which may reroute our samples. So in our previous example, we may instead go from one to three instead of one to two because of perturbation, which then we go from one to three to seven, and then in the, which uh, would be a misclassification and therefore a maximum flow of zero. Okay, so going back to our um, objective here, um, we now can uh, transform this count and correctly classified samples um, by introducing flow variable Z with a set of flow constraints that depend on our tree and our perturbation. And then we'll say that um, our inner sum over Z's here would equal zero for a uh, misclassification. And the inner sum of Z's here would equal one for a correct classification. And so summing over all of our um, data samples and um, introducing this maximization term in inside, um, we would now have the sum of correctly classified samples as a set of maximum flow problems. And so now this gives us um, a linear objective and a set of linear constraints at each stage. But however, we did add complexity to our problem by formulating as two-stage problem. And so the next step is to convert our two-stage problem into one that we can solve with computational efficiency. So let's first take our problem that uh, we formulated and let's dualize this inner maximization problem. And as we know, the dual of the maximum flow problem is a minimum cut problem. So let's walk through uh, this dual formulation. Our outer maximization still stays the same uh, where we decide this tree structure. We still have this minimization of our perturbation set to get a worst case. Um, but now since we, since we dualize a maximization problem, we now have this new minimization over a new set Q, where this set Q uh, will be defined as a minimum cut constraints, since the dual of the maximum flow is again the minimum cut. And note here that strong duality does hold between um, the maximum flow problem and minimum cut problems. And so solving this dual formulation to optimality will solve our original problem to optimality. And so creating a hypergraph reformulation of our problem we now have an MILP with a very large number of constraints. So we're going to use a delayed constraint generation approach where we relax the large, a large number of constraints and then iteratively add the most valuable constraints via a subproblem that we feed back into the main problem. So intuitively what this looks like is that um, we have an iteration between a main problem and a subproblem or in our main problem with our relaxed, uh, where we can relax those large number of constraints, we decide this tree structure and we decide which labels to predict. Then in our sub problem, uh, which we would find a worst case perturbation and associated minimum cuts in polynomial time, which gives us the strongest violated constraints that we can add back to the main problem. And we can do this iteratively until we reach optimality. So um, now that we talked about our solution approach, um, now I want to talk about some numerical results. So one thing that's really important to us is that we want to test the effectiveness of our model in robustness to distribution shifts. So we trained a non-robust optimal tree and a robust optimal tree on 12 different integer and categorical data sets from the UCI Machine Learning Repository. Then we had a held out test set that we perturbed in 5,000 different ways according to some probability distribution and derive the test accuracies of each tree for each perturbation. And uh, we did expected perturbations where distribution on the perturbations of our test set are known in training and then are incorporated to our model. We, and we also did unexpected perturbations where such distributional information is slightly misspecified. And then we, so therefore we don't uh, exactly specify it into our uncertainty set in our model. 
So we plot the difference in our worst case out of sample accuracy between a robust tree and a non-robust tree to see how well our robust tree does in comparison to a traditional non-robust tree approach. So the vertical axis here is the gain in worst case accuracy and the horizontal axis controls the size of the uncertainty set where moving right corresponds to a smaller budget of uncertainty and thus a smaller uncertainty set. So for each pair of plots, the left plot in blue corresponds to the worst case accuracy on test sets with expected perturbations. And the right plot in green corresponds to the worst case accuracy on test sets with unexpected perturbations. So we can see that in general, the larger the budget of uncertainty we allow up to a certain point, uh, the better the performance in our worst case we obtain. And importantly, even if we misspecify the um, budget of uncertainty, we, for the most part, can still yield a favorable gain in worst case accuracy for a robust tree. And even when a perturbation is not exactly what we expect, we can see comparable gain in performance from using our model. And we also did a similar plot, but for average case performance, and can show that as long as we specify the budget of uncertainty correctly, we can still have some favorable gain in average accuracy under distribution shifts as well. So with that, um, thank you very much for listening to this talk. Um, there is a, a preprint available on archive um, via this uh, QR code. We also have a package called ODT Learn where um, you can use these robust trees for your own application as well as other kinds of optimal trees. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. A very interesting talk. And our next speaker is Jose Angel Martin Baos from University of Castilla-La Mancha. And he's going to talk about can machine learning methods effectively model travel mode choice beyond predicted performance? Hello, thank you very much, uh, Nuria, and to the organizing committee. Um, so I'm going to present a, a work that uh, I have co-authored with my colleagues, uh, Julio Alberto Lopez, Luis Rodriguez, Tim Hillen, and Ricardo Garcia. Uh, so let's start, first of all, uh, transport demand modeling is essential tax in the field of uh, transportation planning, as it allows us to model how people travel around the city. This is important for forecasting future transport demand, evaluating transportation policies, and planning possible modification to the transport uh, infrastructure. Uh, this is usually done using discrete choice models that are based on random utility theory. But first, how does these models uh, work? So let's put ourselves into situation. So imagine that uh, we are that individual and we have to decide which transport mode we should select for commuting to, to work. So imagine we have three alternatives. We can choose car, bus, or uh, rail. So the set of all the alternatives we can select from is called the choice set. Then we have a, a feature vector that are called the attributes that are the, the features of the different alternatives and the individual itself. And finally, we have a third element that is the random utility model. Uh, the most famous one, the most used one, is the multinomial logic model. Those models are based on the assumption that all the alternative has a uh, utility. Uh, so the utility that a certain uh, alternative provides us is composed of two parts. Uh, the first part in orange is the deterministic part of the utility with this uh, functional expression that we have to define that relates how those attributes impact on the utility. And we have in blue another part that is the epsilon, which is a stochastic term, that is, it is added to take into account the, the error of the unacerbed attributes that are impacting the utility. Uh, it is assumed by those models that uh, the individuals are rational this means that they select the alternative that maximizes their utility. So we can obtain the probability of selecting a given uh, alternative. However, uh, this, uh, the complexity of transportation system has increased significantly over the last uh, past decades. And those traditional choice models have become insufficient to deal with this complexity. So this is why uh, during the last few years, a lot of papers, a lot of studies are suggesting the use of machine learning methods. 
uh, in the last few papers, the most uh, the machine learning method that has gained most popularity on this uh, specific domain are super vector machines, random forests, and gradient boosting decision trees like HGBoost, for instance and also neural networks and of course deep neural networks and all the different architectures we can derive from deep neural networks so before uh, starting let me uh, briefly uh, summarize what are the differences between random utility models and machine learning methods so random utility models has uh, dominated uh, the world of travel behavior since they were formulated uh, first in 1970s and they have acquired a high degree of sophistication. Uh, one of the main advantages of those uh, models is that they are highly interpretable, but they have uh, an important uh, problem that is that they require the model to specify beforehand a functional expression of, uh, of the utilities as the one you can see here on the screen. On the other hand, machine learning models that have been proved successful, successful uh, on many other applications appear recently as a promising alternative for random utility models to model the individual behavior. They achieve uh, more precision and does not require the modeler to specify that expression we have seen in the previous slide, but they have another problem, that is that they are black post models, so they are really difficult to, to interpret. So, uh, the thing is that traditionally, uh, most studies that have compared uh, machine learning models with multinomial logic models has focused basically on analyzing the performance of, of those machine learning models. To mention a few relevant studies, uh, these are three relevant works that have compared the performance of machine learning and multinomial logic models uh, on accuracy metrics. In those papers, uh, ensemble methods and deep neural networks are the ones that achieve the highest predictive performance. However, the problem is that very few studies have focused uh, traditionally on analyzing another important aspect, that is the behavioral analysis of these methods. Uh, one important work here is the work of Hiller et al. 2021, uh, that uh, performs a systematic review uh, of words that compare machine learning classifiers applied to uh, mode choice uh, modeling. And basically, they identify that many studies in the literature are affected by several methodological pitfalls uh, that are biasing the results they obtain. Moreover, uh, in the paper of Wang, Wang, and Thao, they show that deep neural networks that obtain good results uh, normally in those problems present difficulties that are associated to the higher sensitivity of those models to the hyperparameter optimization problem. And moreover, they have some other problems like model non-identification non or local irregularity. So the estimated neural networks may not be stable in all the situations. And finally, the last two references I'm providing here are some very few papers that recently have tried to compare not just the performance analysis, but trying to analyze the interpretability of the machine learning mod methods using a post hoc uh, analysis. So, uh, in order to solve uh, the methodological problems of previous studies that were identified by Tim Hiller, uh, in this work, we are going to perform a systematic comparison that, co uh, that covers the performance and the behavioral analysis of the models, but the first step is to define a consistent methodology. So, uh, in this work, we have uh, used two data sets, first of all, in green, we have used several synthetic data sets that we have generated uh, using a logit and a probit function with linear and not linear, in this case, Cook Douglas utility functions. And in blue, we have also selected three uh, real data sets that have been selected in many other previous studies in the literature. And the next step is once we have the, the different data set, we have to split them between training and test. And this step is very important. Uh, when dividing between training and tests in order to avoid some problems and data allocates, uh, it is important that all the observations from the same individual or from the same household has to be placed together either on training or either on test. Because if not, maybe the model can be learning with individuals from the same household, as imagine, on the training, and then using that information on the test set. So we are going to bias the results. So this is a problem of many previous studies. Then 
another important aspect is the hyperparameter tuning stage. We are using a five times two cross validation procedure that is minimizing the cross entropy loss. And then we can obtain or we can validate our results on a validation set using a cross validation procedure and also on the test set to see how those models generalize to uh, new data that has not been used before. We are reporting two metrics here. We are uh, reporting the accuracy, which is the most commonly used index in the literature for uh, this kind of comparisons and give us the percentage of correctly predicted observations obtained by the model. But the, the problem is as, as it was identified by the work of Tim Hiller in 2019, he argued that uh, the perform these performance measures have to collect probability-based indices, because this information is essential for later extracting behavioral analysis or behavioral indicators of the model. Therefore, we propose or, or we apply uh, a second metric that is the GMPCA, the geometric mean probability of correct assignment. So using those metrics, uh, the last step that we have uh, performed on, on this study is a behavioral analysis, where we try to extract two very important uh, behavioral indicators, like the market search and the willingness to pay. So uh, in this work, uh, we have addressed the previous uh, problems, or the, the problems of previous studies, and we have performed a exhaustive comparison. In order not to extend myself too much on this talk, I'm going to focus only on, on four fundamental aspects. The first one is the evaluation of the performance of the different machine learning models. So if we observe uh, the results, what we see here on this table for the synthetic data set is that the multinomial uh, logic models are the ones that achieve uh, very good results for linear utilities, as the assumptions for these models are fulfilled. Uh, on this synthetic data set that we have generated. Uh, this indicates that if the assumption of the multinomial logic models are fulfilled, this model performs really well. However, uh, the machine learning method can still achieve uh, a performance that is comparable or maybe even slightly better. Uh, but uh, this is in line what, with what we find on the literature. But the difference appears when we compare them on uh, the nonlinear models, in this case, the Cook Douglas models. What we see is that now the machine learning methods are the best performers, but the multinomial logic model still perform reasonably uh, well, which makes them really robust. In this particular case, if we analyze the geometric mean probability of correct assignment, what we see is that the neural networks are the best performers, followed by support vector machines and SGFOS. Let's analyze now the capability of these models to extract behavioral indicators. Uh, we can denote by F the operational model that is assumed to hold in the empirical domain. This function emerges from the latent probability functions and cannot be observed. Now we can denote by H uh, the machine learning classifier that is estimated. Omega here denotes the estimated parameter vector of those models. And H uh, has a functional expression that is analogous of the previous one, of the one of F, okay, of the one on the empirical domain. Uh, to obtain appropriate uh, econometric indicators from uh, an estimate ma uh, machine learning model, we have proved on this work that it is necessary to ensure that the model satisfy these two uh, essential conditions. This first condition uh, enable, enables the, the model to, um, to estimate a market search with an error rate that is lower than epsilon zero. So if a model fulfills that condition, we can extract, in this case, uh, uh, we can obtain good, uh, good prediction with, uh, with those models and uh, estimate uh, also the market search. The problem is that uh, in order to allow the estimation of elasticities and the willingness to pay indicators, uh, we ha this model has to fulfill this second condition. We have to evaluate the performance on the when we compute the partial derivative of the probability functions. Therefore, um, in this case, uh, it is essential to analyze uh, how the machine learning models can approximate the latent probability functions. Uh, in the paper we have published, uh, this issue is analyzed in, from, a, from a theoretical perspective, 
but here on this presentation, I'm going to focus just on the experimental part. So uh, in the second experiment we have proposed, what we are going to see is to study how these models uh, estimate the probability functions. In this case, I'm reporting just the result for the Cove Douglas uh, synthetic data sets. So what we can see here is uh, um, the probability, how the probability uh, varies as we modify the one of the input variables for a, the selected alternative. The, uh, as this data is synthetic, we ha have represented in black the actual probability. And what we can see is that the multinomial logic models, which returns good estimate uh, for uh, probability functions for the linear utilities, here struggles when it comes to non-linear uh, probability functions, as we can see. Uh, with respect to the machine learning models, what we see is that they actually approximate really well the probability functions, but uh, they have some problems. For instance, uh, the random forest and SGBOOS, which are the ones that are tree-based, uh, uh, have some problems as they exhibit uh, non-monotonic or not inferenceable uh, behavior because of the tree-based structure. Uh, currently, I know that there are some studies that are analyzing how to solve this problem from uh, for gradient boosting decision trees. Um, if we analyze some other machine learning models like the deep neural networks, what we see is that they are highly influenced by the correct estimation of the hyperparameters. So they behave uh, correctly only when the hyperparameters are correctly estimated. Let's focus now on extracting some behavioral indicators. So, for instance, uh, if we want to focus on extracting market shares, in this experiment, we propose three scenarios. Scenario S1 is a baseline scenario where all the market shares are equal. And scenario S2 and S3 are two scenarios where we promote alternative one. This table represents the average uh, estimation error of the market shares. And uh, basically what we can observe here is that all the methods reproduce the market shares for the baseline scenario is one with an error rate that is fairly low, uh, around 0.5%, except for the deep neural network. However, if we focus on the scenarios S2 and S3, where those models have to extrapolate a little bit, what we see is that random forest and SGBoost methods present higher error rates. It is interesting to notice that the multinomial logic models perform reasonably well on all the cases. So this is uh, in contrast with some other studies in the in the literature that report lower values for the multinomial logic model. And with respect to the machine learning methods, the top the top performer is the neural network where the parameters are correctly estimated, followed by the support vector machine. So now. Let's focus on another important indicator that is the willingness to pay. So imagine that uh, you are willing to pay uh, a certain amount of money for a given product. A question that might arise is how much are you willing to pay if, uh, if we increase uh, a certain attribute of the product? So for example, imagine a train with bigger seats. This problem is called the willingness to pay. Uh, the willingness to pay of increasing one unit of uh, the attribute k for individual n and alternative i can be computed using the partial derivative of the deterministic utility function with respect to the attributes. We have obtained on this research uh, that um, this expression is equivalent as this one that relies on the partial derivative of the probability functions s of the machine learning models. So we can obtain those indicators yeah, with the machine learning. Okay. Sorry, yeah. Uh, so um, the problem now is uh, how can we extract uh, or obtain the partial derivative uh, using this machine learning model as they don't have a closed form expression. So in order to do that, we can apply the certain the center di divided uh, different method. So. Uh, Basically, in this figure, what we saw very quickly is that the distribution of the winnings to pay for, for its model. And we can see that uh, in the first row, we have the actual distribution because this data is synthetic. 
And what we see is that the for, Cup, the, for the Cup Douglas utilities, the best methods are the support vector machine followed by the multinomial logic model and the deep neural networks. However, uh, some machine learning models uh, are struggling here, uh, in particularly the ones that are tree based. So, well, we have repeated the same experiment with the real data set, but I'm going to jump uh, this section because the results are similar to the one of the synthetic data set. And let me just in 30 seconds go to the conclusion. So we have presented a comparative study that solves some of the methodological pitfalls of previous studies. And we have focused on, focused on two parts. First, we have performed a performance study. And what we see is that the machine learning method of the stand in the real data set, but on the synthetic data set, uh, they behave similarly to the multinomial logic model. The best machine learning method in performance is the SGBoost, uh, but this advantage of machine learning methods over multinomial logic model is more models that suggested on previous studies, probably because of the problems that those studies are have uh, in the validation uh, when applying the val validation metrics. And with respect to the behavioral analysis, what we see is that the predictive performance of those models is not actually linked with their ability to extract behavioral indicators. So, for instance, the multinomial logic models show really uh, robust results on most situations, but the SDBoost and random forest has so, uh, poor extrapo extrapolation properties and fail to estimate smooth monotonic probabilities, which is reflected on the willingness to pay estimation where support vector machine, neural networks, and these neural networks, where the parameters are correctly estimated, are the only machine learning methods that have consistent behavior on most scenarios. So if you are interested in this research, we have published uh, in more detail this research on transportation research part C, and uh, you can search uh, more information about that on this uh, QR. So sorry for going quite quickly at the end. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jose Angel. It was a nice presentation. And our final speaker is Joanna Molan from Trier University, and she's going to talk about learning the followers' objective function in sequential bi-level games. So Hi, guys. everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, we do. Okay, perfect. So we are going to end the session with a talk about bi-level problems in which uh, the lower level um, objective function is not known to the leader. This talk is based on work I do together with Matt Schmidt and Johannes Tuell of uh, Trier University. And to start it, I'm going to first um, give you the setting and main idea behind our work. And then I'm going to present to you two methods in order to address this underlying problem. And to motivate the presentation, I want you to. Yeah, but we see the the page of the of the meeting, not your presentation. Oh no. Okay, let me see. Um, so I'm here on. I'm clicking on sharing screen. Yeah. And then you and just have then, to the presentation. I see. Okay. And now you should see the presentation itself. Is that the case? But uh, let's see. Yes, we do see the presentation now. Thank you. See the presentation. So now um, you're probably looking at a bi level pricing model. And we're going to use this in order to motivate um, the work behind this presentation. So what we have here are two players which interact with each other in a hierarchical fashion. We have the so-called leader and the follower. And um, due to these hierarchical interactions that we have here, the problem of the follower appears as a constraint in the upper level. And in the upper level, the uh, leader decides on the prices X for the goods Y. And then the leader, I mean the follower, at his turn will um, make his buying decision according to his uh, preferences or constraints which are encoded in his feasible set and um, his objective function or to be more exact in his utility function. Um, so far everything is as expected however it can easily happen in this uh, bi-level setting that the leader does not know what the follower is optimizing. Think, for instance, that the two players are adversaries, so for some reason not cooperating with each other. It can easily happen 
that we um, have missing information in this problem, so we cannot write it down, let alone solve it. Um, right, so now this is the main problem at the core of our talk. Um, more exactly, what this implies for the leader is the following. It means that the leader must take a decision X about the prices unaware of the uh, utility function of the follower. And this is something that can happen repeatedly. That is, the leader will take a decision X and then he will just wait to observe what does the follower do. That is, what is the follower's optimal um, response to the parametric lower level problem uh, Y. And if this happens multiple times, that is, if we have multiple such um, interactions between the two players, this will basically give birth to a data set of um, decisions or prices x t set by the leader and corresponding buying decisions y t by the uh, follower. Our main idea is that um, we can take this uh, data set of observations from the past in order to uh, impute the missing information from the uh, followers problem. Um, in the following, we are going to assume that um, the feasible set is um, uh, known to the leader and that the objective function uh, is not. And at this point, I want to stress that the missing data is only affecting the leader. Obviously, the um, follower himself, he always knows what he's optimizing. Right, so with this being said, I'm going to show you the two methods we uh, use in order to um, solve this learning task. But before we do that, let's first take a brief look at the general setting of a bi-level problem. So as I said, we have here the lower level problem, which is parametrized by the upper level decision X. To be more exact, this parameter appears in the um, feasible set of the follower, which is known to the upper level. And we assume that the quadratic um, utility, I mean, objective function of the follower is not known to the leader and must be learned. And um, more exactly, the two indices um, UC and UQ encode exactly which coefficients in Q and which coefficients in C are unknown to the leader and must be learned. Okay, so we are going to look at the lower level again. And we keep in mind these sequential or repeated interactions between the two players, which lead to the data set, um, because both methods that we use take this data set in order to impute the missing objective function for the lower level. And the first method is so-called MVU method, which is short for multiplicative weights update. Um, we'll take this data set and use it um, step by step. Um, and consequently, the uh, understanding we have about the unknown objective function will also be updated iteratively. Um, the second method we have here, the inverse KKT method, will take the data set all at once and will compute an objective function that is consistent with um, the observed data um, in one step. Right. Um, so with this being said, we are now ready to look in a bit more detail at the first method. Um, so for the first method, we require the data set of past interactions. And we also want to know which coefficients we have to learn in C and Q, which are the vector and the matrix which define our unknown objective. And we also need index sets which tell us which coefficients are positive and which are negative in the objective function. And finally, if some coefficients are already known to the leader, they do not need to be learned, and hence they will be passed as an input to the uh, method as well. This method will generate for us not one, but a sequence of um, objective functions. And I'm going to uh, tell you now how that happens. So for every unknown coefficient in the objective, we will um, initialize a weight and we are going to initialize it to value one. And then we start iterating. For every uh, point in the data set, we are going to first update the unknown coefficients. 
using the corresponding weights. And then uh, we are going to solve the lower level problem using our latest understanding of the objective function, which is obviously given by the uh, newly updated coefficient. Um, I want to stress actually here at this point in the MBU algorithm that I have so far not said anything about the lower level function. Like I just told you that we saw the lower level function, that's it. And this is one of the strengths of the MBU method. It does uh, not need any, uh, it does not make any assumptions about um, how the law, how the function or the problem looks like that we're solving uh, line four. It can be mixed integer, it can be nonlinear, it can be non-convex, it can be anything. As long as there is an oracle that um, is able to give us a solution, why Barty? And uh, the method um, is unaffected by that. Right, so now that we have our um, solution Y bar T, we can take the solution and compare it against the true observed solution that the real lower level, the real follower has chosen in iteration T. And from this comparison, we are able to compute errors, which we assign to each unknown coefficient. And this error is then used to update the weights of the coefficients which we will then use in the next iteration and so on, as long as we have um, data points in the data set. Right, so you have um, seen here in, um, like the algorithm you see here is a very reduced form, but without going into details, I want to highlight the fact that according to their definition, the weights that we update here will always be positive. And consequently, also the coefficients we update in line three will be positive as well. However, we know that some of these coefficients are negative. And um, in order to make sure that we solve the correct uh, problem in line four, we have to manually go there in the lower level and reintroduce the negative signs where they are missing uh, with help of the um, index sets that uh, we required as an assumption. Right, so we have seen that the MBU method will give us a sequence of objective functions that will help us understand how the lower level um, behaves. Um, and you can probably imagine that uh, these updated objectives, particularly those in the first iterations, might not do a very good job at emulating um, the behavior of the lower level of the follower. However, and the relatively mild assumptions we have um, following result about the errors made by our algorithm. And um, we know that the objective error made in every iteration, first of all, has an upper bound. And we also see that the upper bound of this error will converge towards zero for increasing number of points. Um, the objective error that I am mentioning here is the blue part of this expression. And what it basically does, it, it, it evaluates the um, computed or, yeah, the computed objective function in iteration T at two points, namely at the solution we obtain in iteration T and at the true observation we made at iteration T, YT. And if these two values lie close to each other or are equal, then that is very good. And what um, we also have similar to the objective function is the so-called solution. Um, I'm sorry, similar to the objective error that we had here is the so-called solution error. This is basically the same thing, but instead of um, looking at the um, iteratively updated objective, we um, look at the true unknown um, coefficients. Right, so this was the MBU method. We are now going to look at the second method, which is the inverse KKT method. And we recall that the second method will take the data set um, all at once and then compute uh, one objective function in one step. And the aim of this method is that the computed objective is consistent with um, the data set we observe from the lower level, from the interaction with the follower. And um, right, I'm first going to define what a consistent objective is. And put simply, 
a function that is consistent with our data is basically perfectly able to explain why we observe this data. That is, um, the optimum for this function will always be the observation that we made. Right, and in order to measure whether a function we computed is um, consistent with the data or not, we uh, use the so-called relative objective value error, which is the relative counterpart of the blue expression we just saw um, on the previous slide. Right, um, and I'm going to tell you how um, this method works. So not only we get the stronger result using it, but we also need to make stronger assumptions on the lower level. So I told you that the MVU method, it didn't care how the lower level looks like. It basically can handle anything our oracles can handle, so everything is allowed. But here we're going to assume that we have a polyhedral um, feasible set and a concave um, objective. And for this, we have the KKT uh, conditions as written down here. And we're going to use these KKT conditions in order to define so-called residuals. And these residuals are basically anything that um, is a deviation or a violation of uh, the KKT conditions. That is, for instance, if you look in the middle at the stationarity condition, um, any point or, yeah, like uh, if we have a say a violation of the stationarity condition that would be basically our residuals and I want to recall you at this point that in uh, this setting we do have the observations y and x what we are looking for this moment is um, obviously the unknown coefficients in the matrix c and the unknown coefficients in uh, the matrix q in the vector c and now also the variables uh, lambda so what we want to do is we want to find Q, C and Lambda such that these um, residuals are as small as possible. And I'm not going to go into a lot of details, but basically um, this is the model we want to solve in order to do that. Um, and I think uh, with this being said, we can now see how uh, these two approaches behave when applied to um, a pressing instance. So we're going to look at a couple of numerical results that we apply to, again, the suppressing model, the one we started the talk with. Um, so we have here the leader who is um, setting the prices X for the goods Y. And our task is to learn um, the unknown um, utility function of the follower. So that means we're going to learn um, all entries in the vector C and all diagonal entries on the matrix Q, which is assumed in this instance to be a diagonal matrix. Right, and in order to do so, we, as we discussed, we need a data set of past interactions between these two players. And we have a data set with 100 samples, and we first um, use it in our MVU method. And we observe the following. These two here are the two errors that we discussed, the objective and the solution errors. And according to the uh, theorem we had, they do um, converge towards zero for increasing number of samples. Mm, furthermore, unlike the inverse KKT method, the MVU method will not guarantee that we find a consistent um, objective. However, we um, can see that for increasing number of iterations, this convergence measure will show um, a, the convergence measure, like the error that we compute is um, decreasing. And finally, it's a very interesting question for the leader to answer. We saw that the MVU method does not output one, but a sequence of, say, in this instance, 100 many objective functions and then the question that remains to be answered for the leader is which one of these objectives are we going to use and in order to do that we can do like a training or a test where we pick one of these objectives based on some criteria and then we can check how they behave on unseen data points like uh, for instance we took the very last one in the 100 iteration and um, that seems to perform very well making uh, very low errors. Um, for the inverse KKT method, the uh, data set, we take it, we use it, we find uh, solutions which minimize our residuals, they're actually zero. So we have our consistent objective, only one of it, no need to decide which one to take. And there is one interesting aspect about this I want to discuss with you. 
Um, so as a solution of the inverse KKT method, we now have a uh, consistent objective function. However, you see, despite the fact that most of these um, entries in the in the search vector or matrix are close to zero, that is, they're very close to the true um, objective um, coefficient. Some of them, uh, there's a little bit of um, outliers in here. That is, um, say, one of these um, coefficients were not mm, are not um, the same as the true unknown coefficient. And this is um, we found due to the fact that um, for instance, if we're talking here about a pricing instance, um, if we have an, um, a product that up the leader sells, but the follower never buys, that is, that um, never appears in our data set, well, then the model will never learn uh, the true or uh, good value for this uh, coefficient. However, that's, that's not, uh, it's not a problem for us because we still have a consistent objective function that explains the data set perfectly. Right, and to sum it all up, the MDU method has this great advantage that can be easily extended and applied to a wide range of problems due to the low and mild assumptions it has. However, we also need um, big or bigger data sets in order to achieve um, better approximations. The inverse KKT, on the other hand, requires stronger assumptions on the lower level, but um, will then for sure generate a consistent objective function. Right, and with that being said, I'm looking forward to listening to your questions later. Thank you very much for the great presentations. We now open up for questions from the audience. So if you have a question, please write in the chat or raise your hand and we'll give you permission to use your microphone. It seems that we don't have any questions. So once again, thank you so much to our three speakers. And for the audience, we are back on Monday uh, with the regular seminar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.